Hello, everyone, and warm welcome to our guests from all over the world, uh, with a special welcome to the survivors and their families that are with us today. My name is Ronit, and it is a, a heartwarming for me and for all of us at the Ghetto Fighters House Museum to see such a diverse and engaged audience here. We are grateful for your participation. Today we gather for the International Holocaust Remembrance Day event in partnership with the Friedrich Ebert Foundation. And our theme this year is home. That's why we ask you to share where is home for you. I want to explain. The museum was established 75 years ago by Holocaust survivors who came to the Western Galilee in Northern Israel to build their home, Kibbutz Lochamea Getaot, the Ghetto Fighters Kibbutz. In addition to building their home, they created the house, the Ghetto Fighters House, a house and a home, a museum inside a living community. As Antik Zuckerman, one of the founders once said, we emerged from shattered walls and came here to build new walls, new houses that pulse with life. We are commemorating the 75th anniversary of the establishment of both the home, their home and the house, and decided to explore various aspects of these terms to gain a deeper understanding of what their significance and, and what their role is in our lives today. The distinguished speakers we have here today will share different views on this topic, including the duality of home, what transforms a place into a home, all the essential materials of life. I would like to invite Eagle Cohen, the CEO of the museum, to open the event. Hello, everyone. On Saturday, October 7th, I was with my family in our home in Kibbutz Eilon, about two kilometers south of the border with Lebanon. When we first heard the breaking news about the terrorist attack on border settlements in the South, we realized that our world had changed in an instant. The atmosphere of security, calm and peace that we had experienced over the years was quickly replaced by extreme feelings of insecurity, gloom, and above all, danger. In the course of that day, we realized that Hezbollah terrorists were on the border fence and the north was heating up. We decided to live alone. And from that day, we have been refugees in our own country. We are in, the, in our fifth house since that Saturday, not knowing when we will be able to return, to return home. Despite the many wars here in Israel, the security problems and the political tension, we have always felt a solid sense of security in our state. That has changed. Israel was established three short years after the end of World War II. It, re it represented great hope for survivor of the Holocaust just coming out of the inferno of promise to serve as a warm and secure home. When those horrors had come to an end, young men and women who had lost their families and those dearest to them chose to build their new homes in Israel. They had longed for home where they could live without fear as free citizens with equal rights in a democratic society for desires life. Indeed, these Holocaust survivors, together with many Jews, refugees, Jewish refugees who came from different parts of the world, fulfilled the miracle of the creation of the young country built their homes in it and formed a stable and safe national home. Today, and in preparation for International Holocaust Remembrance Day, that will take place on January 27th, 
I would like to draw inspiration from those Holocaust survivors. They were left alone without families, rebuilt their lives and homes, and left us a legacy to light our path toward a stable home open to all its resi re residents. Resistance, sorry. May we rebuild from the current hardship and soon return to our safe, stable, and open society with feeling of home for all. Thank you to everyone for taking part in this special event and a warm welcome to our honored guest, Her Excellency Ambassador of Spain, Mrs. Anna Salomon, and His Excellency Ambassador of Lithuania, Mr. Udrius Brozga. Many thanks to our partners from the Friedrich Hebert Foundation, Dr. Raf Meltzer, the director, and Mrs. Susie Stelmach, project manager, for your long-standing friendship, especially during these days. Thank, thanks to the team members who worked hard to make these events and others throughout the week a memorable experience. Onit Luski, Hava Cohen, Yaron Sur, and Medin Shachar. Our wishes go out to you, Medin, the spirit behind the Talking Memory webinar series. Thank you. A final, big, a final big thank you to each one and to each and every one of you, dear participants worldwide. We wish all quiet and peaceful days soon. Thank you, Egal. Um, I am pleased to introduce uh, Judith Stelmach from the Friedrich Ebert Foundation, a dear friend and partner who will now share her remarks. Good evening, everybody. Thank you very much, Monit and Egal, for the warm welcome. Um, as mentioned, I'm representing the Friedrich Ebert Foundation, uh, which is a German political foundation. Um, believing in social democratic values and trying also to implement them uh, wherever we go and wherever we stay. Um, and we are very, very uh, thankful for the opportunity to collaborate with uh, the Ghetto Fighters House Museum for so many years, uh, especially in the context uh, of uh, International Holocaust Remembrance Day, uh, but also during the year uh, on different other projects and endeavors. Um, the theme we chose this year, home, um, is probably one of the most universal and at the same time, one of the most personal themes uh, that I can imagine. Um, we think that uh, it has uh, a very strong connection both to the past uh, that we are trying uh, to keep its memory up all the time, every day, every uh, single week and month uh, of the year, but especially uh, on, on, on Remembrance Days, like the one that is coming up soon. Um, but uh, it also has a very, very strong connection uh, to the reality that we are experiencing here in Israel uh, during the past few months, as Eagle has mentioned, um, at the beginning of his um, uh, greetings uh, just a few minutes ago. Um, home is something that uh, should be part, um, an integral part of our lives um, in a very natural way. Uh, and until we uh, do not experience uh, the danger of losing it or the actual uh, necessity or, or, or force to lose it, uh, we don't even really think about it. But it gives us the ground for our existence, the safety for having uh, plans and dreams and realizing them. And when it is lost, um, it's really lo losing the ground under our feet uh, in a very, very uh, material way. Um, and um, this is what people experienced in Europe uh, during World War II, during the Holocaust. 
And this is what unfortunately many people have been experiencing ever since in many parts of the world and are experiencing at the moment also in Israel, um, in the place that was supposed to be a safe haven, a home uh, for the Jewish people. Um, so we will have uh, the opportunity to listen to our honored guests uh, who will share their uh, views uh, with us. And uh, I hope that it will be uh, a fruitful uh, and, and interesting uh, discussion uh, that will evolve and that uh, all of you who, who have come to, to share this evening with us um, will uh, uh, will enjoy it and and, and will uh, find it uh, useful uh, for you personally and maybe also intellectually. Uh, so thank you uh, to the Ghetto Fighters House Museum, to all the dear colleagues uh, we have been working with for so many years, to Igal, to Onit, to Chava, to Nadim, to Yaron, to all the rest of the team. Uh, and thank you for joining us and have a good evening. Thank you, Judith. Our first speaker is uh, Rachel Korazim. Uh, Rachel is a Jewish education consultant in curriculum development for Israel and Holocaust education. She opens a window to Israeli society through literature, through stories, poems, and songs of the best Israeli writers, inviting her audience to engage with Israel in an innovative way. Since the beginning of COVID, Rachel created a global community of hundreds of learners who regularly gather online to study Israeli poetry. She teaches at renowned Israeli learning centers like Pardes and Shalom Hartman Institute and in numerous Jewish communities worldwide. In her free time, Rachel enjoys scuba diving in Mexico and the Red Sea. And she's also a very active grandmother of eight grandchildren all living in Israel. Rachel will look into the concept of home through poetry. She will explore the pain, the challenges of having dual homelands as depicted in the poetry of Israeli poets who left their home, their original homeland to settle in Eretz Israel. Rachel. Hi, thank you very much for this introduction. And may I also add, thank you Yigal for including our current situation in Israel in your opening remarks. I didn't know how you were touched personally, but it is good for everybody in this gathering to, to remember that we are all living in a situation in which the meaning of home had changed since the time this conference was conceived and discussed in such beautiful detail. And as the introductions were shared all around, it was said that the speakers will share their own views, their own opinions. And in my case, it is not the case. <clears throat> I will share or I will read together with you words and feelings of other people and let me go straight ahead to my powerpoint presentation so that we can introduce a the voices that we want to introduce to you so uh, here we go and let me just clear a little bit more of the uh, screen for you and you can see that we are going to meet two poets, three poems of two poets. The first is Leah Goldberg, and I included two pictures because we will hear two voices, a one at an earlier phase in her writing and one at a later phase in her writing. And this is why I wanted you to have a chance to look at her as a younger person and then as a slightly older one, really old she never was. You can see that uh, she was born in the year 1911. Oh, whenever we speak about uh, the birth of Leah Goldberg, there is the issue of was she born, born in Kaunas in Kovna or was she born in uh, Königsberg? Uh, she actually was born in a hospital in Germany, but was raised in Kaunas, Lithuania and her mother tongues therefore were the languages of that country. She arrives in the mid thirties, well prior to the state of Israel, to first Tel Aviv and then Jerusalem. But by the time she lands 
in the land of Israel, she is already a published poet. And then she continues to write, to publish poetry, drama, of course, academic articles. She becomes a professor in the Hebrew U, where she establishes the Faculty for Comparative Literature. I always mention that because this is a point there that is painful for me. You can see the year 1970, which is when she passed, not yet reaching 60. I was, I finished high school in 1964. I finished my military service in 67, and I was dreaming of studying comparative literature with Leah Goldberg in Hebrew University. But it was a postgraduate course, and she died before I finished my earlier degrees. And I will never forgive her that. But I compensate by uh, reading and studying a lot of her writings. Uh, the second one is Ita Maria Ozkist. And honoring uh, the idea of what is home, and home oftentimes is connected to language, and home is connected to name, I put his name in two versions. Ita Maria Ozkist with an S is how you will find him on the internet and in publications and such. But underneath, I put the name as it would be written in his original language, which is Hungarian. And he was born in the year 1934. No, not in Budapest, in a small town along the Danube called Sarvash. And he passed away not that long ago here in Tel Aviv. He enjoyed a longer life than Leah Goldberg. And again, in an audience such as yours, these numbers are meaningful. Because it tells you that Leah Goldberg arrived to Israel well before the state is established. It tells you that Ita Maria Ozkes quickly born 1934. Oh my goodness, he is 10 when the Nazis occupied Budapest in 1944. What happened to him? How did he survive? All those of us who are involved in Holocaust history and Holocaust educational studies know that these days are meaningful. So underneath I put also honoring my own origins uh, in, in Hungary, the full name as it is written and pronounced in Hungarian. So uh, if you were speaking Hungarian, you will always say the last name first. So it will be Kest Peter Ervin. This is how his name would be pronounced in Hungarian. Lea Goldberg comes, leaves home behind of her own volition, her own choice. Ita Maria Ozkest and the family make Aliyah after the Holocaust. Let us start with Lea Goldberg. And for that, we are going to move ahead. And what you see on the screen right now is for students and lovers of Israeli literature, Israeli poetry, one of the most famous poems, not only by Leah Goldberg, uh, but in general. And you can see that it gave the name to our gathering as well, the heartache of two homelands. It comes from this poem. And I cannot enumerate to you the many times of lectures, motos of lectures, etc., are quoting this line. So this is the earlier poem. It is part of a three poem series called Trees Ilanot in Hebrew. It's in a relatively early publication of Leah Goldberg. She's already in the land of Israel. These are not the poems that she had written before in Lithuania. She's already here. She's already teaching. She's already publishing. It is my custom normally to read the original Hebrew first, just so that you hear the sound, especially in this one when the poet invested so much in the onomatopoeic sounds of what she's talking about in Hebrew, something that will be lost to us in the translation. And then honoring the translator, Rachel Tzviya Beck, we will work with the translation. So let me go to the original. Kan lo eshma et kol hakukiya, kan lo yachbosh haetz mitznefet shelig. אבל בצל האורנים האלה כל ילדותי שקמה לתחייה. 
צלצול המחטים היו היה, אקרא מולדת למרחב השלג, לקרח ירקרק כובל הפלג ללשון השיר בארץ נוכריה. אולי רק ציפורי מסע יודעות כשהן תלויות בין ארץ ושמיים את זה הכאב של שתי המולדות. איתכם אני נשתלתי פעמיים, איתכם אני צמחתי אורנים, ושורשיי בשני נופים שונים. פיין, פיין טרי, in some translations. Here I will not hear the voice of the cuckoo. Here the tree will not wear a cape of snow, but it is here in the shade of these pines my whole childhood reawakens. The chime of the needles once upon a time I called the snow space homeland, and the green ice of the river edge was the poem's grammar in a foreign place. Perhaps only migrating birds know suspended between earth and sky the heartache of two homelands with you i was translated twice with you pine trees i grew roots in two disparate landscape honestly truth should be told i could have spent all my 30 minutes this is what i was given and i'm grateful for on this poem but i will not i will not but I will try to sort of cherry pick for you a few things that are worth noticing. Obviously, the notion of home in this poem is the land, is the home land, not just a house or an apartment or a street or a neighborhood. And I want you to see something that is apparent in the Hebrew, even if you cannot read it, it's very important. And tr translation loses a little bit of it because of the grammatical structure, but still keeps it. So I want to take you to the first line that starts in Hebrew with two words, kan lo. And in English, here I will not. So, okay, the English needs four words for the same notion. We are here. I'm here at the place which is now home. And I want to start talking to you about it. And I will start with a negative. I want you to know what I miss when I'm here. So she is planted. We will see that at the end of the poem, the title is Pine, and she will talk to the pines, towards the end of the poem. <laughs> and if in poetry, as well as in literature in general, you are looking for the point of view, you are looking to who is speaking and you want to know who is the addressee, in this poem, you need to go all the way to the end before you can see that she is talking to the pine trees. But at the beginning, we are invited to hear the conversation without knowing exactly who she is talking to. We will find that out in the last stanza, not so long. And she starts, if I wanted to make fun of Leah Goldberg, which I will never do because I love her poetry so much, I would say she starts with scratching. She starts with being homesick. And she starts enumerating everything that this country is lacking. Oy vey, no voice of the cuckoo. The tree will not wear a cape of snow. Look at how she mixes so beautifully the sound of the cuckoo, the white color of the snow. And you think that you are now going to hear a lot of whining and homesickness and longing? No. This is Leah Goldberg, very much the teacher at this time, very much the professor in the university and comparative literature. And as soon as she laid down that which is missing, she's raining back, but don't take me on that nostalgic trip. I'm okay where I am. I recognize what I have, but it is here in the shade of these pines, my whole childhood reawakens. I can sit here under the pine trees of Yerushalayim and remember my childhood. I'm okay. It's here that I can do that. Back to the memories. 
the chime of the needles once upon a time. Needles here, needle there. It's now not the missing part. You have pines here, you have pines there. We are comparing. A little bit of introspection. I call the snow cape homeland. I used to do that. Now it's Hamsin, now it's hot, now it's Jerusalem. But sometime long ago, I had another homeland. And in that homeland, it wasn't only the cuckoo and the snow. And the green ice of the river edge. Well, rivers do not freeze and become icy in Israel. And all those beautiful sights were the poem's grammar in a foreign place. I had another language of writing. So she now actually showed us in between the two missing parts, comparing identical or similar parts. And now she is reining in, thinking, sharing a thought. Maybe, perhaps, only migrating birds know, suspended between earth and sky, the heartache of two homelands. Migrating birds have two homelands. They have the winter homeland in Europe, in, the Lith in Lithuania, in Hungary, in Poland, and they have a, when, when winter is there, then they will come to the warmer lands, such as El Tisrael, such as Africa, such as Egypt, etc. And when they wander between the two homelands, the two places that they call home, they get me. I'm a little bit like that. I don't want to commit. And now, finally, after she had expressed that, and I want to open a big parenthesis. I don't know how many of you can appreciate the courage of saying that in the Zionist early years of the state of Israel, new immigrants were supposed to leave old home, terrible Europe behind and embrace the new homeland, you know, arrive, fall on your bended knees, kiss the land and forget everything of the awfulness that was there and there was pretty much in Lithuania. And yet she's not going there. She is not denying the connection. She is not hiding the longing. She is not covering up for what she is missing. But she is making a much more courageous statement. With you, I was transplanted twice. With you, pine trees, I grew roots in two desperate landscapes. I can do that. I was rooted there. I re-rooted here. I'm fine. The migrating birds will get what I feel, but I can tell you, reader, beyond the pine tree, she is now talking to the pine tree, I'm okay here, I'm fine, I can embrace the two homelands. That in itself, in the years when this is written, early, late 50s, probably mid 50s, we always know the publication time of the book and not the exact date of when a given poem uh, is written, is pretty courageous to say in Israel, you were not supposed to be homesick to, for all Europe, especially not after the Holocaust, right? And yet she's honest about it. Let's, you know, sort of hold hands with Leah Goldberg and see another one. Now, I, I hate to say that because I, he, this is the one I love most. Well, there, there is none that I love most, but I want you to look at the date. The date, seemingly the date, trust me from the beginning, this is not the date of the poem. This is the title of the poem. But Tel Aviv 1935 was written in the mid 60s. Leah Goldberg dies in 1970. So this is her last decade. Wow, she is already the honorable world known professor. What happened in Tel Aviv 35? Why would a poet like Leah Goldberg in the 60s, she's not in Tel Aviv anymore, she lives in Yerushalayim by that time on Al Fasi Street 16. If you happen to live or visit Jerusalem, you can see her home with a beautiful sign and all that. What happened in Tel Aviv 1935? She made Aliyah. 
1935 is when she arrives. And 30 years later, literally, she is looking back on that moment of touching the new homeland, which had not yet become homeland, only in dreams, etc., in Zionist ideas, in ideology. But their reality was not yet created. Now look again at the title and the date. We know what these dates mean. They do not only mean that Ita Maria Ozkest, our next poet, is one years old in Sarvash. It means that this is already after the rise of the Nazis to power. This is when major, major wave of immigration from Germany starts arriving to Israel. People who look around them don't like what they see and leave Germany. People from Poland will arrive in the 30s for a variety of reasons. You know this history if you are into Holocaust studies. And now Lea Goldberg, again, quickly, at least a stanza or two from the Hebrew before we tackle the translation, a, a, the exact same translator. Okay. Tel Aviv, 1935. וכל עורב שעמד על חודם בישר יבשת אחרת. והלכו ברחוב ציקלוני הנוסים, ושפה של ארץ זרה הייתה ננעצת ביום החמסין כלהב סכין קרה. איך יכול האוויר של העיר הקטנה לשאת כל כך הרבה זיכרונות ילדות אהבות שנשרו חדרים שרוקנו אי בזה. כי תמונות משחירות בתוך מצלמה התהפכו לילות חורף זקים, לילות קיץ גשומים שמעבר לים ובקרים אפלים של בירות. וכל צעד תופף אחרי גבך שירי לכת של צבא נחר ונדמה אך תחזיר את ראשך, ובים שטה כנסיית עירך. A line that I love a lot, I'll try to make you love it as well. Tel Aviv, 1935. Then the aerials on the city roofs were like the mast of Columbus ships, and every raven that perched on their tips announced a new continent. And the kit bags of travelers walked the streets, and the language of a foreign land cut through the heat of the day like the blade of a cold knife. How could the air of the small city bear so many childhood memories, wilted loves, rooms which were emptied somewhere? Like pictures blackening in a camera, the clear cold night reversed rainy summer nights across the sea and shadowy mornings of great cities. And the sound of footsteps behind your back drum the marching songs of foreign troops. And it seems if you but turn your head, there is your hometown church floating on the sea. Let's take this slowly. Remember, this is reminiscing. It's written 30 years later. It's not a clear, we landed today, I was looking for a room to rent. No, it's something very different. It's those images that remain in your mind after 30 years. And the first one is telling you, you know, I was looking at Tel Aviv when I arrived and the city looked to me like a boat, like the Columbus ships. And the aerials on the top of them and the ravens, they, they didn't look like something stable. Maybe the land was still moving under my feet as a newcomer. I did not yet have my feet, you know, on the ground. The, the ground itself looked like a boat. And I wonder if those ravens that were perched on tip and announced a new continent is that an image for a boat that is floating the oceans or are the ravens telling the countries of the people and where they are coming from? Because after the city as a boat, we have another image, also metaphoric. It's not I met Joe Schmo from my town or somebody else. 
and the kid bags of travelers walk the streets. Can you see her reminiscing eye? She remembers the immigrants carrying bags and suitcases. It's not the people, it's the kit bags that were traveling, walking the streets. So I remember that sight. I don't remember their faces. This is what she is saying. I remember the fact that they were immigrants, that they were carrying stuff, that it was heavy. And then I remember sounds. And the language of a foreign land cut through the heat of the day like the blade of a cold knife. She's Neros Israel. Leah Goldberg loves Hebrew. At age 10, she's already trying to write in Hebrew. She dreams about herself in her diary. She wants to become a woman Bialik, Isha Bialik. She wants to be a poet like the poet Bialik. Okay. And yet when she hears the foreign language in the Chamsin, the Hebrew does not say heat. It, it, it names that phenomenon of dry desert wind. Now, let me tell you from other poems, Leah Goldberg hated Chamsin, hated. This is why she moved from Tel Aviv to Yerushalayim. It was easier. No, it's not the reason, but still. I, I teach a whole series of Leah Goldberg and the heat of Eretz Israel poems. She honestly hated it. So for her, even just to hear another language, a European language in the heat, was just like a cold knife blade cutting through the city. And now after she described the town tour for us, after the sound of the different languages, she's now wandering at this new place and look what she sees in it. How could the air of the small city bear so many childhood memories, wilted loves, rooms which were now emptied somewhere? Do you know, Tel Aviv, she's asking what you are now carrying? Do you realize what we immigrants bought, brought with us, the dreams and the loves and the empty rooms left behind? You cannot. Like pictures blackening in the camera, this is what we carry in our hearts. The clear cold nights reverse. We don't have clear cold nights here anymore as we used to back home. Rainy summer nights across the sea. Who has rainy summer nights in Earth Israel? Nobody. You never have rain in the summer. These are all memories and the shadowy mornings of great cities. We don't even have that many great cities in Israel. These are all memories. And now comes a very honest revelation. It's not just ideology that brought us here. And the sound of footsteps. Remember 1935? Footsteps behind your back drum the marching songs of foreign troops. Let's be fair, ladies and gentlemen, not all of us were ardent Zionists. Some of us are refugees. We came because there was no other choice. And coming that way with the longing, and it seems if you but turn your head, there is your hometown church floating on the sea. Oi. And now take all your Jewish values and Leah Goldberg is a great Israeli poet and she's telling you <clears throat> when I'm thinking about my hometown, when I turn my eye to the sea and I could imagine a memory floating towards me from Kaunas, from Kovna. And what does she remember? The church. If you ever take the trouble, the time and energy to do a Leah Goldberg tour, in Kaunas, you will see why. And I was there last May and I found the church and the home. I needed to. So here is another at the top of her career. Just let me tell you about the experience of coming into a homeland. It's so complex, so multicultural, and I don't have a lot of time, so very quickly to Another beloved poet born in a little beautiful town called Sarvash along the Danube with Lilac, etc. 10 years old during the Holocaust survived because luckily they, luckily they were deported to Austria 
to a family a concentration camp and not to Auschwitz where most Hungarian Jews were deported. He wrote poetry already then and there. And I will go straight to the English for brevity and time. Dual Roots, the title itself, Du Shorish, and the upper title of the book, In the Hand of the Identity Molder. You come to this country, your identity will be molded. And the translator this time is Avraham Eitan. In the middle of Tel Aviv Street, suddenly, to smell a drunken lilac. Oi! Yeah, we have a few, but how many back in Hungary? On the street, sweating like a man, because while the sweat covered my glasses, the drunken blue-eyed lilac grew in every corner of Tel Aviv Street. And it was too hot, but the fragrance was like the sleeping draught. And in the middle of the street, I saw a river, also heard the sound of a bell. And in the middle of the city, a man lives on the Mediterranean coast. And in the shade of the lilac, the stranger has seen sitting for years on the seashore but is still sitting on the banks of the river. Hevre, he says, nothing doing. Give me just a whiff of the fragrance of a lilac from back home, and I do not see this huge Mediterranean in Tel Aviv. I see the Danube back home, the river by which, I, I, so, sorry, it's not the Danube by Salvas, it's the Kurush. I see the river of my hometown and I live in Tel Aviv on the seashore, but in my mind, I'm still sitting on the banks of the river. I think that this is voice enough for the complexity of the notion of what home is. And I think these two very clear voices both of them committed to Hebrew, both of them committed to the Zionist idea, yet both of them courageous and honest enough to say your first home is never forgotten, even once you have put your roots in the new land. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you for, as you said, cherry picking for us emotions and ideas and dual roots and uh, being rooted in and, and re-rooted. Thanks for the fascinating reading of the poems. Thank Our you. next speaker, we look at another, um, we can say haven, um, the United States, <laughs> where about 140,000 Holocaust survivors arrived immediately after the war. Beth Cohen uh, received a master's from Harvard and a PhD from Clark University's uh, Strassler Center for Holocaust and Genocide Studies, the first American university to grant a PhD in Holocaust history. Her first book, Case Closed, Holocaust Survivors in Postwar America, is an analysis of the reception of survivors by the American Jewish community. Her second book, Child Survivors of the Holocaust, focuses on the experiences of the youngest of the Sherita Plita, surviving remnant, who came to the US after the war. She has taught at UCLA, Loyola Marymount University, Chapman, the Cal State University um, in, North, in Northridge. She has also contributed to numerous edited book collections, documentary films, and educational projects, and most recently completed an exhibition on the Holocaust for the UN headquarters in New York. Beth will discuss the experiences of Holocaust survivors who came to the, night, to the United States and their complex process of finding a sense of home and a place of belonging. Beth. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I want to thank the uh, Ghetto Fighters House Museum and the Friedrich Ebert Foundation for uh, and the organizers for uh, hosting this, uh, this event today. And thank you for inviting me to participate with my esteemed colleagues. It's really an honor to be here. And Rachel, I, I really learned a lot from 
from your words. Uh, thank you uh, to people all over the world for tuning in. And of course, to the survivors who are listening, uh, it is your voices that give life to and animate my work. February 17th, 1949, the SS Marine Jumper pulled into New York Harbor. Among the 546 displaced persons on board was one whose arrival was captured by a New York Times reporter. She wrote, as he, quote, stepped on the gangplank under a gray afternoon sky, a free man on the last bridge to the country of his choosing, and walked on to the bunting drape pier at Canal Street. He gripped his son's shoulder and his face streamed with tears of happiness. He kept murmuring in Yiddish, quote, we are here. Now I believe we are here. The father and son were two of the 140,000 surviving souls of the remnant of European Jewry who immigrated to the United States between 1946 through 1954. Their stories of hopeful beginnings and welcoming homes appeared frequently in the contemporary media around the country, as you see here, two examples, emphasizing the speed with which they became model citizens and blended easily into the fabric of American life, helped along by their new hosts. My research tells a different and more complex story. Through documents and oral histories, survivors reveal an exceptionally difficult period of adjustment, often lingering for years. They recall outright rejection by their American co-religionists and their own relatives. They remember the message they received in no uncertain terms. Forget about the past, keep quiet about wartime experiences and move forward. It is this gap in perceptions that interests me and first provoked me to raise some of the very same questions posed by one reporter nearly 60 years ago. Quote, how would the refugees fit into American life? Above all, would Americans accept them into their homes, their communities, and hearts? End quote. What I ask was the reality of their post-war reception in America. Next slide, please. Fortunately, just as I began my research, I discovered a collection of case files written by social workers at the Jewish Family and Children's Services in Denver, Colorado. This included records of survivors who settled there from 1946 to 1954. This led me to hundreds of case files at the New York Association of New Americans, or NIANA, a Jewish agency created in 1949 to work with refugees in New York City. These collections were the starting point of my study. And you can see here just a couple of examples, some handwritten letters, other typewritten records of meetings that uh, representatives of the Jewish agencies had uh, with survivors. Unmediated by time or by our current iconic perceptions of survivors, they provide a window into the world of refugees, new Americans, displaced persons, or DPs in the aftermath of the Holocaust, a universe parallel to, but vastly different from the PR images of the day. Through these files, I learned that the American Jewish community established an agency in 1946, the United Service for New Americans, or USNA, to resettle the newcomers around the United States. In 1949, USNA created a New York branch, NIANA, as I mentioned, to assist those DPs who remained in New York City. And that was about 60%. One of the first questions that emerged from my research was, where did your refugees want to go? Can I have the next slide, please? And which communities were willing to take them? USNA negotiated with communities around the United States in order to persuade them to agree to a quota of newcomers. It was a struggle for USNA to convince cities and towns not only to accept refugees, but in some instances to keep them. And here's um, a map uh, produced by USNA. I apologize, the quality is taken from a very old picture, but it gives you an idea of where survivors were sent and the 
you'll see the outline of New York State and some of the uh, surrounding states in the tri-state area, and that is where most of their survivors were clustered. However, as you can see, all around the United States, um, Jewish agencies agreed to accept and work with survivors in their communities. In some communities, the idea of helping was fraught with seemingly legitimate complications. From 1949 until the early 1950s, Emil Salomon, the executive director of the Tulsa, Oklahoma Jewish Federation, argued that Tulsa Jews were too few and the employment opportunities too limited to absorb the number of refugees that USNA had asked of them. To USNA's request that Tulsa accept an additional 10 refugees beyond the 24 that the city expected for 1949, Mr. Salomon replied, following a protracted meeting of our executive committee yesterday, it was decided that we dare not increase our DP unit quota beyond the 24 units agreed upon when you were in Tulsa. I've already notified Mr. Edwin Rosenberg and USNA president to this effect. The chief reason is no jobs. Mr. Solomon went on to describe the first DP to come to Tulsa, who after three months asked to join his sister in New York. The man, quote, failed utterly in his first job as a tailor's assistant, Mr. Solomon reported. Perhaps USNA might send him from Tulsa to New York. Columbia, South Carolina appears to have been one community willing and eager to try to, um, to become involved. In May 1949, an USNA newsletter featured a primer and resettlement for small communities, outlining how the people of Columbia responded to the appeal for help. With no Jewish federation in town, representatives of the synagogue Zionist organizations, the Unity University of South Carolina Hillel, the Hebrew Benevolent Society and B'nai B'rith all joined together to mobilize the resources of the 200 families in the Jewish community. The article also described the enthusiasm that spilled over to the 90,000 residents of Columbia along with planning hot meals, furnished apartments, English lessons, jobs, babysitting, medical, dental, legal, and psychological services. The committee also enlisted help from local hairdressers who agreed to provide a free, quote, American up-to-date hairdo to each female newcomer. What happened when the refugees, American, please don't, um, can you go back, please? I this isn't the correct um, image. Yeah, thank you. Uh, what happened when the refugees, American relatives, rather than communities, were the sponsors? The response was mixed, very mixed. Sponsors who brought together families who were blood relatives, but had never met and often had vastly different expectations of each other in their new relationship. Many American relatives felt obliged to provide the affidavits that were the DP's tickets out of Europe, but it's clear that they never intended to make a commitment beyond this. Indeed, once the refugees arrived, despite written promises of help, the files are right with entries such as, the US sponsor is quote, a distant relative who was in no position to help as she was a worker herself, or relatives could not meet the obligation they had agreed to, or the relative could no longer help because quote, her financial situation was very bad. Financial aid was one thing, emotional support another. The newcomers needed to feel that they finally were not alone in the world, that someone, especially Mishpacha, cared. Therefore, when moral support went undelivered, the rift could be irreparable. One new arrival noted that he, quote, didn't want anything to do with his man, his sponsor, and how much he and his wife resented him for not even inviting them for a Seder, something which they had been longing to attend for years, which they didn't have after they lost their parents, end quote. The night Bale arrived in New York in 1946 is still a painful memory more than 50 years later. Her cousin greeted her at the dock and brought her home. Their arrival coincided with the airing on television of the Milton Berle show. It was, quote, very, very, very popular Everybody was watching Baylor recalls. It was such an excitement, like who knows what was going on. And I came in the first night and instead of talking to us, she left us and went to watch Milton Berle. 
Sonia is still bitter when she recalls her first day in America from a distance of over half a century. Their sponsor, her husband's uncle, was supposed to meet his new family at the boat. No uncle appeared, nor did any of his five married children. With $13 to their name, the family took a cab to his address in Brooklyn. Upon reaching the home, they found it dark. A neighbor told them a day earlier, quote, the Cantors left for Florida. They're not home. Sonia greeted this news with bewilderment. Quote, they know we are arriving the next day. They get a cable. None of the children are waiting for us. The uncle picks himself up with his wife and leaves for Florida. That, referring to her husband, is his nephew, his brother's son. I was devastated, she said. After all, she pressed on, quote, they were not ignorant. They know what happened. They know the family was killed. Aren't they anxious to see somebody cheer us up to say we're here for you? I'm glad you survived, end quote. The longing for family was often one-sided. Those far from the horror of Europe had limited imagination about what this need meant, while those who had passed through it were desperate for family connections. After all, it was the primary reason cited by memory by many survivors in choosing to settle in America. For some, their American relatives did not disappoint. Rachel remembers that when other DPs heard of those who had family in the United States, she remarked, they remarked, quote, oh, they are lucky, they're going to relatives. I didn't say anything because I didn't know my relatives. I couldn't say if they will be good to me or not. How would I know? As it turned out, she too believed she was one of the fortunate ones. Quote, my relatives, she states emphatically, were very, very, very good to me. But she was in contact with others who experiences differed sharply from her, her own. When families reneged on their commitments, when refugees were sponsored by communities, or when the newcomers were desperate, they turned to agencies such as Niana. The agencies adopted the philosophy that they were offering a new beginning to the refugees. What becomes immediately clear from the case files was the agency's focus on employment. Their goal was to help DPs find work as quickly as possible and join the ranks of productive American citizens. By the agency's own accounts, it was doing an exceptional do- job. Usna President A. Rosenberg called it, quote, an era of ma- magnificent achievement. And here on the left-hand side, you see an article that appeared in the New York Times. DP's quick to catch Temple of America survey shows and goes on to say, how well uh, the newcomers are adjusting in America. And indeed, it quotes the head of a major welfare organization terming their adaptability amazing. The agencies, and on the other side of the screen, you'll see an example from New Neighbors, which was an USNA publication talking about um, the experience of newcomers in Flint, Michigan, uh, and a survivor who is doing exceptionally well, David Budowski. The agency's assistant, however, was not the only reason they could claim success. Another possibility exists. Several months after thousands began to arrive in New York, Niana reached a new mandate. Previously promising help to DPs for five years, the organization reversed this decision and initiated a new policy. This limited assistance to one year. Here's where the case files illustrate a different picture of agency assistance, and along with it, a more complicated vision of refugees' adjustment in the aftermath of the Shoah. Mr. and Mrs. G, 29 and 23 years old, respectively, arrived in New York on April 26, 1949, with their 20-month-old twin boys. They turned to Niana when their relative could no longer assist them. The family needed funds for an apartment, clothing, and furniture. In addition, there were medical bills. The twins had an infection, infection which required a doctor's attention. The agency worker met with their family and optimistically recorded Mr. G would be able to, quote, follow through with help from the agency. For the next year, the family met with Niana representatives who chronicled Mr. G's attempt to find work, any work. He tried to find a spot at a fruit store, but the employer had no place for him. He secured work at a laundry, but was too weak to perform the required tasks and was let go. 
an undershirt factory in Brooklyn, employed him but was soon laid off. He found a position delivering chickens at a kosher butcher, but the shop owner pronounced him too slow for the job. Mr. G's social worker noted in his file he was not, quote, making a real effort. In the meantime, the twins were beset with constant health problems. Finally, he began work as a delivery boy. Three weeks later, he was fired. By then, it was mid-January and the clock was ticking. In another four months, Niana would terminate aid to the family. Mr. G suggested that his wife, an experienced seamstress, find work. The caseworker agreed. Mrs. G would seek employment and her husband would care for the twins. But several weeks later, she was hospitalized with heart problems. She was too ill to work and her spouse could not look for employment because of the children. Things began looking up slightly a few weeks later when Mr. G found a training job in machine diamond cutting. After 12 weeks, he would earn a minimum salary as a diamond cutter. Niana agreed to continue subsidizing him during the training. Eventually, he completed the apprenticeship and began earning $20 a week. At this time, the federal minimum wage was 75 cents per hour, or minimum salary of $30 to $40 a week. As is often the case with immigrants, unscrupulous bosses took advantage. On May 25th, 1950, time ran out for the G family. Niana terminated financial aid. Mr. G expressed concern over managing on his meager income. The caseworker explained about welfare and the Brownsville va- fa- branch of the Department of Welfare. The G family was t- stamped Cape Closed. The family case closed. The family was on its own. The experience of this family was not unique. Rather, it reflects recurring patterns and themes throughout the hundreds of files I analyzed, a striking contrast to the success stories in the post-war media. Nevertheless, if that's all they revealed, it might be tempting to conclude that every immigrant group faces the very same challenges, and this group was no different. Certainly, the agency offered a conventional approach to immigrant care, limited financial assistance, vocational counseling, and English lessons. But what is also monumentally clear is that these were immigrants like no others. They were survivors of genocide. And astonishingly, those dispensing aid were very nearly blind to this fact. Time after time, the DPs make their struggles crushingly apparent in the files. In the agency's rush to have their clients become self-sustaining, however, this aspect of the refugee's care was overlooked. In a letter to a social worker, a young man, Yaakov, expressed his feelings about his new life. He was satisfied with his office job and his progress in English, but he wrote to his social worker in Denver, this is one side of the medal. The other side is not very hot. I'm very disgusted and from day to day I'm getting worse. Very nervous. I feel some kind of nostalgia, not for my country, my home. The word my country doesn't exist to me. I miss my lost family, my friends, and the system of living. I can't get adjusted here regardless of my attempts. I really drive myself very hard in order to get Americanized, but this is useless. My trying has no success as yet, and I don't think they ever will have. There is a wall of customs, characters, and attitudes. I do not have anything in common with those around me. They will never understand me, even if I speak a better English than they do. It's a terrible problem to me. Furthermore, I don't seem to see a sense in life, and little by little, I lose the courage to live, and that worries me. We can all take only so much and I am only a human. The example of Yaakov illustrates how one immigrant seemed to be adjusting according to the agency's standards, employment, learning the language, getting on his feet. Nevertheless, he clearly felt a sense of despair rather than achievement. Can I have the next slide, please? And here I want to point out is a quote, admittedly, I'm jumping a little bit time-wise, but this is the same survivor who was featured in the little article 1950, where the article described how well the survivors were doing in Flint, Michigan. 
um, and particularly how David Berdowski was doing. And here is David speaking 30 years later, and he says, there's not a night that hardly goes by that you don't dream about it, that you don't have nightmares, that you're being chased by Germans, chased by the SS, and very bad nightmares. Sometimes you wake up in the middle of the night screaming, and we have to live with it. We just live with it. It's just as bad living with it now that almost was in the camp. Sure, you established a family, you established a home, and everything else. But whatever happened, you can never, we can never forget it's very, very bad to live without parents, without brothers, without sisters. It's very bad. Many, many stories, both in the case files and the oral histories, echo Yaakov and David's and reveal the bumpy terrain that the survivors trans tra traversed as they move forward in America. By focusing on the practical demands of the immediate future, the trauma that the D DP survived was often obscured, minimized, or ignored. At, and at the same time as we see, the immigrant clients were clearly suffering. One woman told her caseworker that, quote, she suffers severe dizziness, heart palpitation, high blood pressure, and a variety of anxieties. She went further on to say how she, quote, wakes in the middle of the night screaming. And although she does not remember exactly what the dream was all about, she does know that it was very bad. Her anxiety plagued her days as well, her social work noticed. She feared the dark in subways and, quote, occasionally she suddenly gets the idea that they're about to be deported and worries about that for days at a time, quote. While she was most eager to work, her nightmares kept her awake for hours and she had difficulty rousing herself in the morning. Her social worker did not probe, but as the majority did in similar instances, encourage the refugees search for work. Many, though by no, as the evidence shows, by no means all displaced persons quickly began the process of acculturating to life in America. They looked for jobs, searched for and settled into apartments and began raising families. Although urged to abandon the past and look to the future, the newcomers found that moving forward might be possible but forgetting was difficult. They could not, nor did they want to. Far from repressing their memories, many were eager, willing, even compelled to speak, but few wanted to listen. Survivors' recollections of this are vivid. Quote, we were very bitter, said one camp survivor, because, quote, in the beginning, his voice failed. We started to tell stories nobody wanted to listen. And if somebody listened, they thought that we told them stories that are not true. And from the first minute I spoke, he continued, when I came to America, when I told people, they thought I'm crazy. They didn't want to listen, he repeated. Another woman was ready to tell her new family about the war years. But when her American cousin asked her if she had had orange juice for breakfast in Auschwitz, she knew she could not and would not share her story. Quote, People had no understanding, said Hannah. Even more, said one woman, quote, they didn't really want to know. They were not ready to hear. She remembered, too, that American Jews, quote, were also saying that they had suffered during the war. They didn't have enough meat and sugar. To the refugees, this signaled a deep, even unbridgeable chasm between the two groups and reinforced the belief that their American hosts do not care to hear about nor did they appreciate what their survivors had endured. Quote, I saw a lack of understanding in the first years, so I decided not to waste my time, remembered one woman. It was too emotional to open my wounds, she explained. Even the expression of genuine sympathy toward the survivors was rare, and for that reason important to note. One woman recalled her despair after arriving in the United States. She mourned her murder family so intensely that she could not stop weeping. At night, she screamed from her nightmares and woke her young cousins. Quote, why are you crying, they wanted to know. The young woman told her relatives. Their response was simple and direct. Quote, cry if this will help you, they encouraged her. Moreover, her aunt said, I know it's not easy for you, but we love you and we want you to be happy. Her aunt's understanding meant a great deal. Quote, I appreciate those words, what she said to me, recalled the woman in an interview nearly 40 years later. Till now, I remember them, she explained. 
Certainly there were those who chose to keep silent. Some simply could not verbalize their experiences. But many, many others' recollections belie the myth of silence. Quote, we, the survivors, even me, I'm talking personally. I wanted to. I wanted to talk about it, emphasized Nessie Godin, who settled in Washington, D.C. in 1949. Why, she asked? Because, quote, in the most horrible times during the Holocaust, we used to sit and talk to each other. The women, cold, hungry, all the women used to say, please don't forget us. If you survive, she was instructed, tell the world what happened. Nessie, as do others, take this obligation seriously. Quote, these women asked me to talk about it, she affirmed, and talk she did. But if the outside world is indifferent, to whom did Nessie and others turn? At first, it was largely amongst themselves that they found the persistent desire to recall a common language of mutual grief and sympathetic ears. No matter where they settled, survivors created groups. Some, eager for family connections, sought out their Landsmannschaft and hometown social groups, started earlier by Jewish immigrants in the hopes of finding old timers who knew their murdered relatives. In the absence of Landschaften, survivors created alternatives. In 1950, refugees in Indianapolis, Boston, Denver, and Kansas City all created new American clubs. 12 Polish refugees in Los Angeles banded together in 1952 to form the 1939 club. DPs in Dallas dubbed their association New Texans. Refugees in Cleveland formed the Menorah Group. In community after community, the club sprang up and took root. Even in smaller communities like Providence, Rhode Island, survivors sought each other to create extended families. Could I have the next slide, please? And once together, what did the refugees discuss? Nessie Godin recalled five, six couple of survivors coming to our house on the Sabbath, having a little lunch. What did we talk about? Comparing each other's suffering, telling how it was, talking about how by miracle we survived this selection and that selection. And in a way, I think this was really beneficial to us. We didn't keep it inside. Even in social situations, remarked one woman, the topic always came up. In 2003, Mr. Krell, a Polish survivor, was still meeting regularly with a small cadre of other men at a local coffee shop in New York. Over the years, quote, no matter what we started talking about, politics, the stock market, we always ended up talking about the war, he asserted, adding, and we still do. In conclusion, my work about Holocaust survivors in post-war America fills a gap between the optimistic PR accounts and the harsh reality that survivors faced in their new homes. Comforting as it would be to accept the cheerful stories that were highlighted on the radio and newspapers, it would be false. Yes, there were instances of those who found work quickly and had no assistance either from the Jewish agencies or their relatives. But for so many others, as they move forward towards an uncertain future, the economic path was bumpy, the emotional terrain treacherous and the help they received disappointing. Together, their stories coalesce into a portrait more fragile and complicated than the public images of the early days. Many years hence, this would change and survivors would secure their honored and well-deserved place in their American home. Thank you. Thank you, Beth, um, for an eye-opening talk. Um, <laughs> One of the questions that was uh, put in, in the chat deals with the, what happened with refugees um, in terms of helping uh, themselves, among themselves, and outside of the family circle. Um, I don't think we have time for that, but it's an interesting question. If you have like one sentence of an answer, um, that would be great. Well, or yes. Sure. I'll just make it very brief. Many of them, as I said, turned to their own groups for help and they found support, sometimes financial aid. And also in New York, um, for example, there was something called the Blue Card, which is an agency that still exists that was actually started by earlier by German refugees. And that was also helpful to some of the survivors of the King's United States. That's Thank a, just you. a very brief. One. And other questions that come to mind and uh, Future talks, we'll be able to address them. 
deals with the differences between adults and child survivors, the story of orphans. When we spoke about this uh, topic ahead of time, you mentioned a quote that um, I can't get out of my head. You said, my war started after the war for child survivors. The whole complex uh, attempt to find and establish a home was another war. Um, but um, I'm leaving this uh, hanging up in the air with uh, I uh, hope people will be curious to read uh, both your books and uh, continue exploring this subject. Thank you so much for your presentation. Um, we're moving on and um, I'll say that bridging uh, global Jewish communities is our next topic. It provides a transition from the pain that was discussed so far to some form of healing by encouraging a sense of connectedness and belonging. Iris Posklinski will address the nuanced question of what home means for the Jewish people and where it can be found. She will present part of her research on how relationships between the Jewish homeland and Jews around the world transformed over time, and particular, particularly how it evolved um, towards a partnership model. Iris is a community social uh, worker who has been researching and practicing partnerships for many years. She wrote a partnership theory that was established and awarded best academic article by the European Network for Social Policy Analysis. She also investigated the uh, transformation of philanthropic relationship between Israel and overseas and as part of her work at the Jewish Agency for Israel and Jewish Federations in North America, she uh, engaged in strengthening connections and engaging communities around, um, around mutual goals. Iris has two boys. She lives in the Western Galilee and she grows a vineyard and makes delicious home wine with her husband, uh, Yoram. So Iris on home away from home, from peoplehood to global partnership connections, moving from pain to a form of healing. Tadaba, Wanit, um, and uh, thank you for this opportunity to uh, be with you tonight and um, uh, present some of the insights from my uh, PhD research. And thank you to Rachel and to Beth for uh, an inspiring uh, lecture uh, taking place uh, just a minute ago. Um, and this opportunity of gathering and uh, commemorating 75 years uh, um, for the International Day of uh, Holocaust. I'm thinking after what uh, what we've been through three months ago, it's hard for me to um, decide if this moment in time is, uh, is, is a moment of hope or a moment of despair being again at... Um, it's such a, um, a time of, of threat to the existence of the Jewish people living um, in its own uh, homeland. So um, I hope that this um, that we will never have to um, um, have uh, days of days to commem commemorate um, such um, such tragic uh, events. So I will uh, speak in the 20 minutes that I have um, on uh, the historic perspectives uh, of um, home um, for the Jewish people. And uh, since the Jewish people are dispersed around the globe, even after the establishment of the State of Israel, I will also discuss the bond between those who live here and those who live abroad um, and present some of the insights from, the research, from my research which investigated the transformation of the relationship between uh, Jewish people who live here and uh, overseas through the evolution of a partnership spirit. Um, Uri, can we have the first uh, slide, please? Yes, thank you. Yeah, uh, no, no, the one before, uh, just the one before, um, so, Long, long before um, Israel um, uh, was established, the connection of the Jewish people to its to Israel as a homeland um, takes place five thousand years ago. To the moment, uh, to the biblical uh, uh, moment in time, when uh, Abraham was told by God to go onto that land where He will make Him a great uh, nation. Um, then 
in uh, w w after 400 years of slavery in uh, Egypt, it was the fifth generation of uh, slaves who departed Egypt and walked for 40 years in the desert towards the promised land without knowing uh, how life uh, how life can be there, just living on uh, prayers and uh, um, memories, uh, collective memories that pass from a generation from one to another. Um, and still, they've done that. Uh, the story of the exodus from Egypt is really a story about coming back home to uh, Israel as a homeland. And then for um, over 1,000 1, of years, there were kingdoms in the land of Israel, the kingdom of David and of Solomon's uh, um, and, and other others who conquered it. The land of Israel and ruled here for hundreds uh, of years. The Greeks, the Babylons, the Romans, the Othmans. Um, two of the temples in two different times were um, uh, disrupted, and the Jewish people who lived here in the in in, in the Jewish homeland were exiled twice during that. 1,000 uh, years, once by the Babylons and later on by the Romans. Um, and, and, and since then, um, in exile, Israel remained as, as a memory of a home, um, a, a, a memory that passed on from one generation to another, again, just like at the time uh, in Egypt, without really knowing what it is like, without experiencing living there. Um, and and that period of time was for, for a very long time. And here uh, you see a quote from uh, Yehuda Levi, um, poet and a writer who lived in Toledo, uh, Spain, he wrote that poem uh, with this line, my heart is in the east and I in the utmost west. He wrote that 500 years into exile. Um, and he based that on on what? Um, if not on, only on, uh, on this memory that passes from one generation to another, heritage, prayers and stories that uh, are kept from uh, one generation to another. And we're jumping uh, almost 2,000 years later. Uri, can you please pass the slide? Todaraba. We're uh, jumping to the, the end of the 19th uh, century, to two, period, to two decades uh, in time between 1880 and 1900. During those two decades, transformational events took place that formed um, and, and impacted the establishment of the Jewish state. And we can think about ourselves. We live in uh, 2024. If we think back 20 years before to the year of 2000 even, would we be able to accomplish such massive accomplishments like the visionary leaders back then accomplished in in 20 years. Um, it's remarkable to think about that. And in times when there were uh, hardly in transportations, no computers, no emails, no cell phones, and yet they've done what we're um, going to talk about just, uh, just now. So Herzl is uh, writing his first uh, book, The Jewish State, uh, where he seek to um, to lay out um, a practical way of um, um, realizing the dream of having um, a, a national home for the Jewish people. And he writes it one year before the first Zionist Congress uh, in uh, Basel. The book opens 
by explaining why it is so essential and critical to have um, a national uh, home, a country, uh, and by describing the anti-Semitism that took place back then uh, in Europe. In this book, he raises for the very first time uh, the option of having a Jewish homeland, not in the homeland, but in Argentina, really. Um, and and strangely enough, yes, it was, it, it actually happened. And in Mosesville, near Cordova in 1889, uh, a colony of about 10,000 Jews was established, funded by the Baron Rothschild, uh, and they had a vibrant Jewish life with seven synagogues and schools, and it it, it was an experiment of, of building a, a Jewish community at times when uh, Jewish communities were not as organized as they are today, uh, of course. Needless to say that at the same time, the Baron Rothschild also invested a, a lot in establishing the colonies, the first colonies here in Israel as well, in Rishon LeZion, in Zichron Yaakov, in Roshpina, etc. Um, and he believed so deeply that, yes, one day there will be a Jewish state uh, here in Israel, that he uh, left an endowment fund of what is what is will be considered today 30 million pounds dedicated to building the Jewish parliament in Israel. And that was many years before the establishment of the state of Israel, which he never uh, lived to witness, of course, and not even his son uh, was able to witness, and it was his uh, daughter-in-law um, who was present in 1966 in Jerusalem by the Knesset when uh, um, when the Knesset was established, thanks to his dream and commitment to to that idea. So um, in uh, 1902. Uh, Herzl is writing his second book, Alt Neuland, which means the old new land. The original name of the book was actually uh, The New Zion. A year later, this book generated a discussion around yet another consideration of a new, another locality for a national home. This time it was Uganda in uh, Africa. And we won't get into the whole uh, details. Yes, the urgency was again uh, anti-Semitism and the uh, pogroms that took place in Kishinev at that time. Uh, and he tried, Herzl tried to convince the Zionist Congress that we must have a Jewish uh, state urgently, even if it's not on, on uh, the land of Israel. And uh, of course, there were uh, objections, but at the end of the day, this idea um, was abolished, not because of the Zionist Congress, but because of the Brits who uh, um, did not want eventually to have a Jewish colony in Uganda. But in any event, this point in time, um, the um, uh, first Jewish Congress in Basel was a formative moment in the Jewish history where over 200 volunteers, all visionary leaders gathered from uh, 12 different countries, mostly in Europe, which was the center of the Jewish uh, world back then before the Holocaust. And the purpose was one, let's talk strategically, even if that word would, did not exist uh, probably, but let's talk strategically on how to make this dream come true. And indeed they developed a very clear, very sharp, very impactful strategic plan, uh, which you see the photo uh, of it, of that um, uh, brief uh, agreement on the four parts of the plan. Um, we won't get into that, but um, uh, 
um, I, we can move on with the slides, please. Uh, I will just uh, briefly mention that the magic of it was, like we say in community social work, the magic is to give a role to everybody that they will feel ownership um, for for the the initiative, and that everybody could contribute if it's by making aliyah to Israel, by uh, working the land, by raising funds, by uh, teaching uh, Hebrew, by uh, doing uh, lobbying and advocacy. Everyone who wanted to be part of this big mission could find a role within that strategic. Uh, plan that they developed. And if we can uh, move on to the next slide, please. Uh, we can also witness that much of what began and was instigated at uh, at that time, through thanks to the uh, first Congress uh, in Basel, we still see it today in the Jewish world. All the methods of collective gathering, of communal life, of uh, of lay leadership, of uh, putting your money where your heart is. And if you want to be a board member at a Jewish institute, then you need to also be a donor. That used to that was called the shekel uh, model of philanthropy um, and and lobbying and advocacy that still takes place today. All those ideas and methods that were developed back then by those volunteers, visionary leaders, is still taking place uh, today uh, in today's uh, Jewish world. The Jewish world was organized through that moment in time. And as Herzl said, we can move to the next slide, please. And as uh, Herzl said, indeed, in Basel, he established the Jewish uh, state. And uh, we can, uh, you can click on again, uh, please. Uh, thank you. And it's uh, it's uh, this picture tells the whole story of belief and determination. Um, when in in two years ago um, they commemorated uh, 125 years for that moment in time in uh, in uh, Basel. Um, can we move to the next slide, please? To the Arba. So we're jumping again about uh, 50 years. Uh, in time to the establishment of the state of Israel, as if nothing happened in between, but we will focus on that particular uh, place and uh, moment in time. And in the Declaration of Independence, I want us to pay attention to two uh, points uh, um, in reference to the concept of home. First of all, it recognizes the historic connection of the Jewish people to the land um, and and to the 2000 years of exile being away from their homeland and the right that was given to them, granted to them by the League of Nations to come, come back and return to that land that they were uh, um, uh, exiled from 2000 years before that. So that's one part um, of the declaration. And the second one that is um, also talking about the concept of home, but in, in a in in a in a manner that actually created tension between um, the new government here and Ben Gurion and the U.S. Uh, and the and the American jury was the. Uh, can you click please on uh, again? Thank you. Is this line that refers to the expectation from Jews around the world? to uh, immigrate to Israel. Well, we all worked hard in uh, um, planning and uh, um, establishing the state of Israel. Now it is, it is time for Jews from all around the world to make Aliyah, to come to, to live here and, um, and take part in, uh, in, in its uh, upbuilding. Well, that did not uh, go through so smoothly, with uh, especially with American Jewry. Uh, can you please click again? Thank you. We well, jumping to uh, partnership is uh, has to go through the two um, two stages uh, in the relationship between Israel and uh, World Jewry uh, since the inception of Israel. Um, 
it started it started by being a very one-sided relationship where uh, World Jewry invested in the establishment of Israel uh, and funded um, everything that happened here. The relationship was not between people who lived in Israel and people who lived in Jewish communities around the world. It was a connection between uh, between the government of Israel and leaders of uh, of institutions, Jewish institutions, and the relationship was more of. Uh, uh, donor uh, and a country that received donors and a country that received the funds it was transactional relationship, but very emotional, of course, and the commitment was uh, um, very uh, profound. Um, but it did it it lacked what we call uh, a peoplehood connection, a people to people connection back then. Around. Or after the, uh, or after the um, Yom Kippur War, uh, when massive volunteers from around the world came to help out um, and more um, pilgrimage um, visits um, um, came to Israel, it intensified after that. So the 70s and the 80s were an opportunity to experience Israel more closely, to meet the people of Israel, which did not happen before that. Before, it was a mythical perception of uh, of the young people in Israel, uh, showing only the side that uh, made Jews around the world very proud, uh, proud of. Um, but the 70s and 80s made it a more humanistic connection. Um, and for the first time, a twinning platform was uh, instigated, connecting communities in Israel, back then mostly uh, uh, neighborhoods, disadvantaged neighborhoods, with Jewish communities abroad. That was Project Renewal. But it opened the door for the more... Um, um, uh, form for the for the form of partnership that we know of today, which is more uh, uh, equal and mutual, and that's the partnership model, which takes place in the past uh, um, thirty years. So, in a partnership, and you can uh, click on the slide for uh, quickly. Thank you. Uh, and in a, in a partnership, what matters is the connection, and not the transaction, and not the donation, and it's not the investment in rehabilitating neighborhoods in Israel that matters. It's not the investment in building Israel that matters. It's actually the connections and the recognition of the needs of the other side as well, which never was on the agenda until the 90s. Uh, a slide that we skipped before that talked about uh, evolutions during the 1990s and the awakening of Jewish renewal and the concept of Jewish peoplehood that allowed, you know, Rachel began with uh, Lea Goldberg, and one of the concepts from Lea Goldberg's songs is the chalon uh, uh, is the effect of a window and a mirror. When I meet the other, or when I look outside, I also see myself, and that's the nature of a partnership. We are gathering together, but. I learned so much about myself through the connection, and Jews in abroad learned so much about their Jewish identity and uh, heritage by meeting Israelis, and vice versa. We know of so many Israelis who say that they go from Israel to Jewish communities abroad. They go as Israelis, but they come back Jews as, as Jews. They experience Jewish life that they never imagined before. So a partnership is about Equality is about dialogue, it's about friendship, it's about sitting around a table uh, for dinner and talking about challenges in the Jewish world, not in a formal way, but in a, uh, in, 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 um, in a more humanistic way. Um, and uh, if you can please click on the next slide, that will uh, take us to... Um, our region, one of 43 regions of partnership across Israel, is ours right at the top, if you can see the circle there. Um, that's right by the border with Lebanon, but this is the Western Galilee uh, partnership region. 
Um, and you can see back to what uh, Eagle Cohen was mentioning before, where he lives is right by the border. And that's where this uh, partnership region is located as well. And it's partnered with 17 Jewish communities in uh, uh, central uh, area US and with Budapest. But again, this is one of 43 regions partnering and connecting uh, close to 400 communities uh, worldwide and with Israel. So with this, I will uh, pass on to Feige and to Tanya to, to dive into one of the programs that is delivered by this particular partnership. But I will just say that all projects in every partnership are not carried for the sake of the project. They are carried for the sake of the connection that they allow, that they enable. So, to thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Iris, for opening us, us up to the uh, world of partnerships. And we will end our program today with uh, Tanya Ronen and Feggy Benstein, who actually, um, um, one lives in Israel, Tanya, and the other lives in Toledo, Ohio, second and third generation of Holocaust survivors, who will discuss their participation in one of the partnership projects that they both founded called Sliding Doors. Um, voices of the second generation. And as Iris said, it's about the connection. It's about the bonding, about the sense of belonging. Um, so sliding doors, door with one O, not double O, not a spelling mistake, as you wrote, is a virtual space, a home where second and second gens, as you call it, explore their identities and come together and talk about their home with parents and their home today. And I'm um, I would love for you, Tanya, to say a few words about that project. So I would like, first of all, to thank the Ghetto Fighters House for hosting us, making it for me um, possible to close a circle. I used to work in the Ghetto Fighters Museum, teaching about the Holocaust, and now I am somehow working with what I've learned there in the partnership and in this project. So thank you, uh, Ghetto Fighters Museum. Then Rachel, Rachel Korazim, who was one of the lecturers at Oranim um, College, teaching us about what it means to be a Jew overseas uh, when I was studying Jewish pe peoplehood. And it is for making it possible to, to do what we do, Peggy and me. So this project is a project between the Western Galilee and Akko in Israel, the um, central area in the, United, in the US and Budapest. It actually started at Feige's living room on one, one leg and the other leg in Budapest, Hungary. Both um, sides of the ocean were looking for ways to um, tell the story of the Holocaust in schools and connecting the next generation with the survivors. Budapest has a problem of not knowing any uh, a lot about what happened to the families of the Jewish um, people of today. And Feggy was struggling with uh, volunteers in schools telling the story, but she will say something about it later on. And when they told us um, what they were looking for, I said, wow, this is something that we can <clears throat> work on because we have here in Israel some second gen and third gen. And it would be very interesting to see how in different parts of the world, the second and third generation are processing what happened to their parents or grandparents during the Holocaust. What has been um, told in homes? What has been left by parents and grandparents to the next generation? And what we as second gen, I'm second gen, Peggy's third gen. Um, what do we want to tell our kids so that they can carry on the memory because we all believe it should never be forgotten. So what we do is, uh, or what we did three years ago, 
we started forming groups in each of the American federations here in our region in the House of Partnerships and uh, in Budapest in the um, Israel Cultural Center. And from there, COVID helped us a lot by connecting by Zoom. So we were probably the first uh, partnership using Zoom as a way of connecting face-to-face, name-to-name, and connecting people to people. And we learned about the people themselves, what they were doing, and what the family was like. Then we discussed ho- Jewish holidays. I, for one, discovered that there are still people in the US, I'm not talking about Budapest yet, but in the US, people who were afraid to say that they were Jewish in the open. Not, for me, it was a revelation. I was so shocked. And people who did not celebrate Jewish holidays, also for me, something very, very new. And then um, we decided we are going to put it on paper. So uh, we started interviewing the participants in the different federations. The idea is to collect all those testimonials and make either a virtual um, book of partnership memories or a a real book, but anyways, to make a collection of it and make an exhibition out of it and leave the whole material with the Ghetto Fighters House, which is primarily for me, part of my home. I have different rooms in my home. One is partnership, the other one is Ghetto Fighters House, and one is my community here in Israel. So that is me <coughs> and what Thank we you. Do. Thanks, Tanya. When we spoke earlier, you said that the community that you've built actually um, put, brought together members that, um, that could feel and sense, uh, that could feel a sense of home in each other's homes, right? That's how you connected to our theme today. Feggy, can you share some memorable experience about that sense of home? Less about the product, more about that sense and that feeling of togetherness and home and bridging those. I can, thank you. But before I say a word, I must, on behalf of the Jewish community, the Jewish Federation in Toledo, express our unconditional love and support. October 7th, while the world seems to have lost the context, we have not. And we just want to say, Am Yisrael Chai, Netzach Yisrael, Lo Yishakher. Okay, so um, we began this program, uh, our federation, our uh, Holocaust education director. I was a professional at the federation at that time. We realized that, that there was... How are we going to continue this? And um, my wonderful partner, Tanya, uh, described it. I wanted to express to you some of the experiences we have had and memories. Um, Budapest. I was in Budapest three years ago, and one of my, one of the uh, participants in this program, came running over to me. Her name is Yudit. I don't know whether she's on. But she came running over to me, and she threw her arms around me, and she said to me, Feige, don't ever, ever leave me. That is the impact that this program has had. Um, And then she and I had the distinct pleasure and pain of visiting and touring the uh, ghetto uh, in Budapest. The connection has become so profound because with each other, and we also realize, by the way, that the different experiences in different countries, uh, the three continents are very, very, uh, very different. The other memory I want to share with you was in Israel, in the Western Galilee, after Budapest, we came to Israel, and there was a session with second and third gen. 
And I was so incredibly moved by Israelis who were Shoah survivors and fought in the War of Independence and in the Six-Day War. So here I am listening and connecting personally in Israel with these amazing, precious people. So this program has become very personal for all of us. Uh, it has created a sense, if you will, that there is no time or space that will ever come between us. And we look forward to continuing the program, for it has an enormous, enormous, enduring, lasting effect on all of us. Thank it you. Has, it has become, in a sense, our home. Thank this you. This group of people. Right. Yeah, and and, and our, let me just, it's the Toledo home, the partnership home, the three continents home, we're all in each other's homes. Thank you so much. And 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 the idea, the, the title itself is brilliant, Sliding Doors, Sliding Generations. And thanks for sharing. We I hope it will inspire others to uh, come together in such a way to discuss this concept. I would like to end by thanking all of the wonderful and uh, insightful speakers, exploring a concept that usually feels so natural to most of us through poetry, historical research, practical experiences. Your memorable experience, Tanya and uh, Feige, was really fascinating. We started with the pain of those who left behind a beloved home, with the ruins, uh, the ruined, um, the ruins of homes after the Holocaust. We went through the complications of starting anew and concluded with a form of healing. Um, I hope that this journey also connected us through maybe unseen threads to the founders of, of the house, of the Ghetto Fighters house that, was, that were mentioned at the beginning. Some of us by, might be making connections to um, the present. Uh, can a ruined house be reborn and regain stability? Um, just putting this out there. Um, anyway, I believe that we all view this term now in maybe in a more nuanced and more complex uh, way, realizing that home is not just a physical place, it's a state of mind and much more. I would like to thank all of you that stayed with us uh, for two hours now. And um, I really hope and wish for all of us peaceful days, calm days at home and in settings that are, that might be for some of us temporary homes. Thank you all. And we look forward to seeing you in our next uh, upcoming sessions.